Right, well, thanks, Serena. So, as Serena said, I'll set the scene today for this panel discussion. So, agriculture has changed quite a lot over the last 40 years. Uh, so, this includes things like the number of farms, uh, the area farm, the mix of outputs, the types of inputs used. Then these changes have occurred for pretty good reasons. So, it's profit-maximising farmers have done things like adopted labour-saving technology or they've purchased the neighbour's farm to improve economies of scale. So given agriculture is exposed to world markets, uh, agriculture can't stand still. To reach the $100 billion target, uh, it will need to maintain competitiveness, so the pressure to adopt the latest productivity enhancements will remain. However, there is a tension here. Historically, the sorts of things that farmers uh, have, have implemented uh, have resulted in less labour being used on farms. Uh, and this can have implications for regional economies that have relied on employment in agriculture. So what I'll do today is highlight some of these trends and try and explain how they link to regional economies. So it's widely known that the number of farms has fallen in Australia over the last 40 years. And while the number of farms has small, uh, fallen, the average size of the Australian farm has increased quite substantially. So for the average broadacre and dairy farm, it's increased by about 70% over that time. And at the same time, the real, that's just adjusted for inflation, gross value of agricultural production at the farm gate has increased. And in terms of employment, you can see here there's been a steady decrease in employment in agriculture. And when I say employment in agriculture here, I mean all people that work on the farms, not just the owner or the manager. And we see that despite the reduction in employment, the value add of agriculture has actually been steadily increasing. And so this suggests that agriculture is substituting labour for capital. In terms of employment, agriculture's share of employment, uh, as a share of national employment, you see here that agriculture's share has been falling steadily over the last 35 years. And we know that this trend extends much further back than the last 35 years. And this is due to both a reduction in employment indirectly in agriculture, plus an increase in the employment across the economy. And so technology developments are a key driver here. And a, a good example, I think, is the adoption of Roundup Ready cotton and round bales in the cotton industry. And that has drastically reduced the amount of labour required on a cotton farm. And technology developments will need to continue in order to reach the 100 billion target. So not all technology developments will result in lower labour demand. Some may result in a different skill set altogether, or they may result in a shift in employment to elsewhere in the supply chain. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with this. Uh, Australian agriculture operates in a global competitive economy, and this trend in employment is a, is a result of individuals making decisions in their own best interests. So the mix of outputs from agriculture has changed through time due to a range of factors, such as uh, changing in commodity prices, uh, technology developments, and changing levels of government support. We see here there's been a steady decline in livestock products, so that's mainly wool and dairy while cropping and livestock slaughtering has increased over time. And so these different sectors have different input requirements, which can again have low on implications for regional economies. And this is through things like labour demand. In a recent survey conducted by ABARES, we found different types of agriculture use different types of labour, and that the vegetable and horticulture sectors are much more labour intensive, and they use much more labour at key times of the year, like planting and harvest, but not so much at other times of the year. So that changing profile, again, can have implications. So large farms now make up about 15% of the total number of farms. Uh, and this compares to less than 5% 40 years ago. In terms of the share of output, the consolidation and productivity gains now means that about 60% of output is generated by these large farms. And in terms of total farm uh, land and income generation, the figure is about the same. So ABARES has found that larger farms are more profitable than the smaller ones, and they do have higher productivity. And this is likely to be the main driver of the shift towards larger farms. And again, it's a consequence of farmers making decisions in their own best interests. I'll talk a bit more about productivity in a minute, but I thought it might be worthwhile just to mention a couple of things about small farms. So small farms are likely to remain a part of the landscape for quite a long time to come yet but collectively they do produce a very small proportion of total output. And they tend to be concentrated in areas that have quite high amenity values or they're quite close to uh, larger regional centres or capital cities. 
And it's in these places where there are greater employment opportunities. And this employment uh, that they receive from those other opportunities helps support farm household income. And our survey data shows us that in fact, in small farm households, the majority of income is from off-farm sources. Some of these are ag-related and, and some aren't, uh, but just like large farms, small farm owners will make decisions in the best interests of, of themselves. And we again need to be realistic about uh, why people live on small farms. And it, we tend to think that uh, increasing output generally isn't one of their main drivers. So moving back to productivity, over the last 40 years, productivity growth in the dairy and broadacre sector has increased on average 1.3% and 1% per year, respectively. So broadly, productivity growth has come from uh, improved practices on farms, such as use of technology and management skill, and from what we, we call resource reallocation. And this is a process where farm inputs shift, where more efficient operators purchase farms and inputs from less efficient operators. And the catalyst for this growth, we, we say, comes from two main sources. One is economy-wide uh, reform associated with national competition and microeconomic reform. Uh, and the other is from uh, agriculture-specific deregulation. So think about dairy deregulation or the reserve price scheme. And of course, R&D development and technology uh, uptake. Larger farms are more productive for a bunch of reasons, but you know, better managers is probably a key one. But we also think that technology providers are more focused on this set of farms, making the technology available for larger farms more efficient. But whatever the reasons, it's a, it's a global thing, and we observe this in lots of countries. We've also seen a, a bunch of changes in the irrigation sector. Particularly, we've seen the development of water markets in the southern Murray-Darling Basin. And this has facilitated trade of water allocations and entitlements, and consequently, we've seen land use changes and shifts in water use by region. But these changes aren't always pain free. A current example is the expansion of tree crops, and in particular almonds, in the lower Murray part of the Murray-Darling Basin. So voluntary trade of water allocations and entitlements and favourable commodity prices has meant that there's been a significant expansion of almonds in that area. And the consequence of this is reduced water use in other parts of the basin. And these, again, can have flow-on implications for those regional economies. And one of the challenges here is that the changes happening in these regional economies is driven by much more than just the changing pattern of water use. And it's very difficult to untangle those drivers. So we end up with very emotive um, uh, arguments around this issue. So this brings me to population change. Overall, our population has grown by about 40% since 1991, which equates to about 1.4% per year. But you can see here from this map, the growth has been far from even. And it's in coastal areas and capital cities where we've seen the most growth, largely driven by migration from overseas. We have also seen many larger regional centres grow quite substantially. So examples include places like Wagga Wagga or Bunbury or, or Dubbo. We've also seen population decline in many areas. And, and a lot of these areas are in regional or very remote areas and have relied on employment in agriculture. So a couple of examples here, you know, Longreach in Western Queensland or far Western New South Wales. So what do we think all this means? Well, I expect farms will continue to make decisions in their own best interests. And, the, um, and I expect further consolidation of uh, farms and the trend towards larger farms to continue. For continued growth, reducing impediments to innovation by freeing up or opening markets and not shielding agriculture from competition will be important. <laughs> as well keeping pace with changing consumer preferences, adapting to climate change, and managing scarce resources. If all this happens, I think it's fairly safe to say that agriculture in the future will look quite different to how it looks today, just as it looks different today compared to 30 or 40 years ago. And how agriculture sits in regional economies will probably also change. And this will include how many and what you know, jobs in agriculture looks like and where they are based. A growing agriculture won't necessarily mean more jobs on the farm. It might mean more jobs elsewhere in the supply chain, but again, it's no guarantee that these jobs will be at or near the farm. Uh, processing or technical support services, for example, might be undertaken in major regional centres or capital cities or even, even overseas. There will be trade-offs and tensions that will arise as agriculture grows and seeks to remain, uh, maintain its competitiveness. And for example, there'll be tension between ag industries competing for land and water and labour. 
and there will be difficulties arise as small towns continue to shrink and larger regional centres grow. So an example is uh, in these larger regional centres being able to meet the infrastructure needs of these growing towns. So anyway, that's probably enough from me. Uh, I think there's probably enough things to get us going there and I'll look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, David. So I think everybody can stay seated. Does that work for you all? Yeah. So that's what we're doing. Um, so five minutes from each. Now, Paul Lindwall is a full-time commissioner with the Productivity Commission and has served as a senior official with the Australian Government Treasury, the Department of Finance and now the Productivity Commission. We'll focus on macroeconomic policy, financial markets, industry policy, uh, national security and social policy. Um, he's currently presiding commissioner for the National Transport Regulatory Forum with an aim to improve safety as intrinsic to increasing productivity. Uh, we know that certainly transport's what keeping the regional areas connected and the food coming to the cities. He's also just written uh, the advising the government to remove remote area tax concessions, which he's a little <laughs> unpopular at the moment. So let's hear from Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Um, I, I thought I might reflect upon some of the reports I've been involved in in the last few years that might be the better way of talking about some of the themes. Uh, one of them was about immigration, which we put out a few years ago. And that was uh, um, looking at the immigration system. We were asked to um, examine a cost basis for um, allowing uh, visas, which we recommended against. But I mean, the key messages from that is that our calibration of uh, visas towards skills, towards high levels of English ability, uh, et cetera, and uh, diversity of um, countries is important. Uh, as you probably know, if Australia uh, were to stop immigration now, our population would be declining. Uh, but we have a relatively rapid immigration rate over the last number of years, so it's, it's increasing quite a bit. Uh, the other thing that came out of that report, which I thought was interesting for this type of forum, is that most, um, most recent immigrants uh, tend to move to Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth. And we also found, having got some evidence, that to have people settle in a regional community requires them to be there for about five years or more. If you have them for less than five years, they tend to go there for, say, three years and then go to a large city. Uh, I don't know, there seems to be a trend across the world towards urbanisation. Maybe that's due to the ability for people to perceive the benefits of living in cities with the services that um, are available. Now, as David mentioned, uh, there's um, been also in Australia um, a consolidation of regional centres uh, in uh, particularly agricultural parts of Australia, less so in the parts with the resource allocation such as in the Pilbara or somewhere. And that has, um, that has uh, obviously led to larger cities in some cases. If you look at the, um, Serena mentioned the um, recent one on remote area tax concessions, well, 45% of the recipients of the zone tax offset live in um, Townsville, Cairns, Mackay and Darwin. And if, you were to, if Sydney's population was to have grown as rapidly as Cairns, from since 1945, Sydney would have a population of about 12 and a half million now. So it shows that some cities have done remarkably well and they, um, they're no, by, by no means remote anymore. Anyway, I, 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 if you want a question on that, I can answer why we came with that particular recommendation. Uh, the other reports that I, we were involved in, one that's particularly on agriculture, was um, the regulation of agriculture. Uh, and that has a number of topic areas which um, uh, the government's taken up some of them, but not all of them. And I think that if you were to look at what government should or could or may do to improve the types of scenarios that have been posited here, it is in the regulatory space that's most important, I would have thought. Uh, there, there's um, a lot of um, regulation that tends to inhibit the growth of um, agriculture. Uh, transport, for example, is 21% of um, farm gate value, and if clearly the more efficient the transport sector, the, the more easier it is for produce to reach the market. Um, that um, other areas that we covered in there with issues such as land use regulation, you know, the planning, zoning, peri-urban um, developments, where uh, as cities start encroaching on what traditional agricultural land there tends to be resistance to certain, especially more intensive agricultural activities. 
pastoral leases and so on, then environmental regulation, the EPBC Act is currently being reviewed, so um, I won't go into that too much, but certainly um, our, our key issue is that when there are offsets, uh, it should be at a landscape scale rather than a farm scale, which tends to restrict the flexibility of farmers. Um, On-farm regulation of water and water trading rights, that's a very topical issue, of course. Uh, farm animal welfare, it seems to me that in the future, if you're going to um, uh, sell produce into countries, they want to be sure of the quality of the produce and that the um, animals are treated in a, uh, in a reasonable way. And um, we recommended that a um, an, uh, an establishment, an Australian Commission for Animal Welfare, uh, to um, build up the science knowledge of animal welfare and promulgate it to the Australian citizens. Obviously, technologies such as genetic modification, new breeding techniques, drones and telecommunications are critical. And then things such as um, ag, ag chemicals, biosecurity, and so on. And finally, um, I briefly touched very quickly on transitioning regional economies, which was a report that we did that looked at the resilience of Australia by region. We used functional economic regions and uh, looked at um, the diversity, the, the nature of those economies and how they can um, withstand a, an economic shock. So I can happy to answer that in question time. That's Thanks, right. Serena. Thank you, Paul. So to Liz Ritchie, she's the CEO, co-CEO of Regional Australia Institute. She spent nearly 20 years across the corporate government and not-for-profit sectors where she specialises in leading organisational transformation to build a sustainable future. Mm -hmm. Uh, describes herself is a change agent, a marketer, a researcher, and an extremely passionate advocate for regional Australia, heralding from Deniloquin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. As I just said to the panellists, there's nobody prouder than me to be from Deniloquin. Is anyone from Denny in the audience? I can't see. No. Anyway, <laughs> real light. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here. Look, I'm just going to use my f uh, five minutes to quickly talk about why we need a new intervention in regional Australia. And I'm going to focus on a couple of uh, key areas that are important to us. Whilst obviously many of the speakers will be talking um, more directly on agriculture, we at the Regional Australia Institute look at regional Australia as a whole and how all of the moving parts uh, come together for the benefit of all Australians. So everything in regional Australia is interconnected and of course regional Australia is changing and changing rapidly. So uh, I'm, I'm really, really humbled and very passionate to be able to lead an organisation such as, CEDA, uh, such as um, RAI, apologies, um, that provides the evidence to collectively work with a range of stakeholders that are also very, very passionate about um, regional Australia at large. So regional Australia is um, home to just over 9 million people and contributes to one third of our national output. It also provides employment for one in three working Australians. To support uh, agriculture's $100 billion vision, we need this intervention in regional Australia at several levels. In April 2019, last year, we were able to launch uh, Regions Rising National Summit here in Canberra, uh, where we brought some of the brightest minds together and uh, created the first policy hack to look at solutions that would help um, change issues in, in regional Australia. And the hack resulted in some very clear and consistent messages. Governments need to invest more in people and requires a new approach to regional policy. Regional Australia as whole needs a new vision and a new narrative, which I guess has become our number one focus at the RAI. We believe there are several key policy areas that will assist in elevating regional Australia, and these are population, jobs, education, regional migration and infrastructure. But I don't have time to touch on all of them, so I'm just going to touch on two themes quickly. Population. Uh, last year, we also launched our, our national population plan for regional Australia. 
And this is where we proposed that regions can play a much bigger role than previously considered to support that redirection of urbanisation. Our research showed that nationally, uh, young people 20 to 29 are the most mobile, but the movement uh, from major capital cities back into our regions peaks at that 30 to 39 and 60 to 69 age group. This is positive news for, for regional Australia because it brings a mix of skills um, to those regions that are very much in demand. Also last year we launched uh, another report focused on population, um, regional population growth, are we ready? And essentially this report questions the feasibility of the current um, population projections that Paul just talked about. Uh, looking out into 2056, um, what we will largely end up with is four megacities, so Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth. And I guess this is where we start to talk about the intervention that we believe is required. Um, the report looks at different scenarios in would there be a negative in economic impact if we distributed and dispersed that population that's expected to land in the cities out to our uh, connected regional to regional areas. And the short answer is that there would be a positive economic impact. Uh, we don't have time to go into that today, but I'd urge you to look at that report. Um, everything, we, we talk about a range of issues, and in particular, one of them is looking at the potential for agglomeration benefits to come from some of our uh, second uh, tier cities and third tier cities. One of the other key recommendations in that report was to drive a societal shift that would um, encourage more people to, to live, work and invest in regional Australia. And we propose to do this through a national awareness campaign. So there'll be more to come on that space. Um, just lastly, jobs. We've done a lot of uh, work in regional Australia, uh, promoting the work opportunities that currently exist and uh, each month we put out a quarterly jobs index. So currently there's 41,000 job vacancies in regional Australia and this is very significant um, because for too long there's been uh, this, this view that there are no opportunities and I think what's most important about these employment opportunities is, is that they sit within the professional industries and they're very well paid jobs. Um, so this is really important to consider. Um, but People will move for employment, but they will stay for livability. And this is the challenge that we have in regional Australia, given its level of, of diversity. There's much more that I could say, but um, we might hold that for the questions. Thank Great. you. Liz, thank you very much. Let's go straight through to Georgie Somerset. So um, next to you, Joe. here as president of AgForce Queensland, but I know more importantly is on the role of the ABC, or the board of the ABC. Uh, Georgie is a beef producer, highly experienced rural leader and regional strategist. She's also chair of the Red Earth Committee, uh, Community Foundation South Burnet, on the board of the Children's Health Queensland and RFDS Queensland, so numerous community boards. She's been on numerous other state and federal boards as well, representing regional Queensland and the regional and remote women's network. She runs the Beef Farm in the South Burnet and Darling Downs. Georgie, thank you. Thanks, Serena. And um, I'll work hard not to sort of repeat what's already been said, and I think a lot of the, thing, the conversations that have been had over the last two days as well. Um, my passion for regional communities, I started working in rural tourism back in the late 80s. So for 30 years, I've been working in some way to try and build regional economies. And one of the really um, strong things that's come through to me working in other sectors within regional economies is the importance of agriculture to actually drive economies, that there are other industries that will come and go um, like tourism and, and value added, but that agriculture is such a driver of regional ecosystems and regional economies. And it's interesting looking at, at some of Paul's movements and how they've ebbed and flowed um, around seasonal conditions and trade conditions as well. Um, so in Queensland, you know, agriculture, fishing, forestry, those things are absolutely critical to our culture. And the, there's been a lot of talk about the environmental stewardship. And I think that um, in our primary industries look after 84% of the state in Queensland. So the role that we play in actually managing um, native vegetation is about two thirds of the state. And that's native pastures that haven't been 
developed or, or changed. So the, the role that we play as natural resource managers within that ecosystem is critical and I, and I think that's one of the things that um, is essential is that we move forward with the environmental stewardship program and the natural capital and how we, and there's been a whole session here on that and how we actually do that. The other thing is that ag production is going to drive those economies. It's in Queensland, the gross value in 1718 was 13 billion. Um, but interestingly, the 80-20 rule, 62% of the total value came from 18% of those farms. So again, playing back to what David was talking about, the aggregation and how that's going to play into regional ecosystems where we're looking for people to actually live and play and have that social cohesion. It's also interesting, 21% of people engaged in agriculture also volunteer. And I think that's regardless of the time that they're putting into running businesses. And that's part of what we're also looking at is how do we make places livable so that people will work there um, and the comment that, that Liz has just made about people will stay there for the livability. In terms of sustaining the profitability and what David was saying, that people will, people will drive um, change because they want to be profitable businesses. It's absolutely critical. It's what I've seen and I see constantly with my members. They will do these things if it's actually about their sustainability and their profitability. Um, but we need to actually provide the ecosystem around policies that actually maintain that. And, you know, look at the climate risk policies and how we actually reward people and incentivise instead of the punitive red tape approach. And that's one of the challenges I think we face is the, the three levels of government in Australia, which I don't think is going to change any time soon, regardless of the conversations in North Queensland. Um, but, but that we actually have to work within that and make sure that we don't end up with perverse outcomes um, from policy decisions in areas that might not have considered the impact on agriculture. Um, in, in investing in our innovation, we need to make sure that we're actually coupling that with the innovation, the investment in communications. In investing in our livability, it's also about the health and education sector. It's very difficult to have a livable community if you don't have the infrastructure. But they're not traditionally where agriculture spends its energy um, or agricultural industries are playing. So the the multiplicity of policies that impact on the profitability of our businesses and our ability to attract workforce is one of our greatest challenges, I believe. We've also got the challenge of meeting both social and consumer expectations. I know there's been a lot of discussion about that the last couple of days um, and how we, we approach that and, and how we develop those at all levels as well. I, I think in terms of looking at what agriculture um, contributes, as a key driver of the economy, we need to, to look at policy settings that um, enable... I, I hear some of the things that, that Paul talks about, but I'm also challenged that we have uh, federal things that will impact quite great... You know, through things like an award and, and Fair Work Commission and those sorts of things that impact greatly on individuals on the ground um, without the consultation and the consideration of the outcomes. So the engagement prior to policy settings being finalised is one of the greatest challenges I think agriculture faces and the um, strong conversations that are respectful of the differences that, that come to the table but actually have the greater profitability of our whole sector and the sustainability of our communities and our industries um, at the forefront. And I think that's going to be a major part of the conversation around um, environmental stewardship and natural capital, but it also needs to be the conversation around how are we are allocating um, the challenge of growing mega cities with the cost in Queensland, it's about 40% of our cost is transport. And we need the investment in regional roads to actually enable the growth in our, you know, to reach 100 billion. So the challenges of our policy, I think, are, are multiple, but they actually need to be where we're having strong, robust conversations at all levels, um, where we can see those solutions that are um, around profit and sustainability. There are some tensions already I can hear between, <laughs> you know, people's different perspectives. So Joe Palmer set up and runs a recruitment hub for the professional candidates living remotely. It was born out of a backyard barbecue discussion. <laughs> Uh, with a group of like-minded skilled professionals who wanted to stay living and working in regional Australia. She's the national winner of the Rural <coughs> Women's Award and grew up in Jindabyne, studied in Sydney and Wagga, has worked overseas and travelled extensively, and she has also established a learning and tutoring business. So, Jo Palmer, you have five minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Serena. Um, look, I've got all of my bits and pieces here that I was going to say, but I think that... Um, 
all the previous speakers before me have really touched on some things that um, I agree, at least I come from a bit of a, a different view here that it's not so agricultural based, but I think striving for this target of $100 billion really will be determined by the communities in these these rural areas that are trying to actually to do the production side of things. So um, I'm a teacher by trade and two of the schools that I taught in during my career have um, closed due to population decline in those towns. Um, I live outside of the rock south of Wagga with 1,200 people that says on the sign as you come into town, but I highly doubt that that is still the, the actual population <laughs> number. But I think that what we have such a huge opportunity to do um, with agriculture driving this is to actually take some responsibility for that societal change that you just spoke about, Liz, that if we want bigger farms, higher rates of production, and that often means less people in those communities, that's going to mean less families working on those farms, less kids in the schools, all of those things that make it a challenging um, place to, to live in the regions. But on the flip side, we've got access to the most amazing technology. Mm -hmm. Connectivity is improving in rural Australia. And I think that it is not only individuals' responsibilities to sort of start thinking about how they work and how they hire people, but as an agricultural industry, um, as it is it a, a whole entity, to actually start thinking about how they're distributing the jobs that need to happen. So. Um, immigration that you that you spoke about, Paul, like the half over half the jobs that are on the skilled migrants list can be done remotely, and we've got people living in rural areas already that could be filling those positions. But the people making the hires are not willing to think that way about mm. interacting with the um, with those those skills that are already there. So I think um, where I spend my days in capacity building around individuals organisations, but communities themselves to become more remote ready. I think agricultural agriculture as an industry, if we are walking the talk and making the industries that are making a lot of money out of regional Australia, if they're actually um, employing the people that are living there as well. So I think that there's a huge opportunity there and the technology is there. It's free, a lot of it's or it's super cheap. Um, we've got 90 odd percent of the candidates looking for work on our platform at the moment are rurally based and 80 percent of them are women so we have this enormous population living in rural australia that wants to live there they want to have their babies there they want them raising their kids in those towns and we're not utilizing their skill sets and i think as a national economy we've invested a huge amount of money and energy into educating a lot of our population and half the people in our books have still got a hex debt because they haven't worked so I think that the people are there and we just need to really start thinking about how we are engaging with the workforce and, and offering that flexibility to, to get people back into the, um, into the workforce. And as well as a way to attract people to move to towns. We have a lot of um, defence spouses that sort of get moved around that are on the books, but also um, doctors, their trailing spouses are quite often the reason that they won't move to another town because the spouse is like, well, what am I going to do there? Um, so really being able to support jobs that do need to be on the tools, but by bringing a whole family because that, that spouse can um, be working remotely from somewhere else. Thank you very much. I've got a number of questions that I could target just at you, though, but we'll, we'll move on to Fiona as our final speaker and then we open the floor up. So, uh, of course, you know her as the current president of the National Farmers Federation. She's a mixed grazier and farmer, sorry, mixed farmer and grazier with tertiary qualifications in business and education, and she has a passion for local food production and the growth and sustainability of rural and regional Australia, which has led her to her current career in agricultural advocacy and as the NFF non-executive director. She'll be addressing um, regional agricultural deals. So let's 
hear from you for five minutes. Yeah, thanks, Serena, and thanks very much, everybody. It's been a fascinating um, couple of days as I've dipped in and out of some of the conversations and even listening to the panel um, this afternoon, uh, the issues of which I am so passionate about. And I thought it was useful. I want to do a quick duck dive in my five minutes into the reg regional agriculture deals, which is one of the actions uh, within our 2030 plan. But first of all, I just wanted to reflect very quickly on why NFF launched their $100 billion vision a couple of years ago now. And while we travelled around Australia talking to people right across Australia about the things and the, and the way, what they thought about their future looked like and how they could potentially drive their future. And that was because we felt that agriculture absolutely needed to be in control of its own destiny. Uh, too often we seem to sit on the receiving end of policy. Uh, we are all, all often touted as, as the whinging farmer mentality where we just have to take what we're given. And we felt very passionate that we have a strong industry in Australia. It's certainly been a strong foundation industry uh, over many, many generations. And we think it's going to be a very strong industry as part of our growth. But we needed to have um, a, a a roadmap as to how we were going to get there. And so um, I just wanted to show you that. So there's still many hard copies of this around the $100 billion guide, and you can go online and, and download it, because to us it was very important that it is a living document. And so each of the five pillars, whether it's customers, sustainability, innovation, people and communities, or capital and risk management, actually has a, a cascading set of, of actions and metrics. And we go on, uh, we go and, and measure those and look back and reflect and, and evaluate how we're travelling every 12 months. And we've already done that uh, first 12 months in. So dipping in and out of conversations over the last couple of days, whether we've been talking about trade or the environmental stewardship, biodiversity, technology, it's all fitted really neatly into some of those uh, pillars. And I think they're all essential parts of seeing agriculture actually attain that extra, that $100 billion of value that we hope we can measure. Part of that is, we believe, being very strategic about how we grow uh, regional Australia and how we grow it uh, in terms of agriculture and how and our contribution. Uh, what we've seen in the past is that a lot of regional growth is, is political. So we see that uh, spending and, and buckets of infrastructure spending or buckets of funding come out because of election priorities rather than actual strategic thinking about where are our agricultural centres? What sorts of products should we actually be producing there? What is the cost freight? What is the cost of getting those products to port? How can we better sit that up? Is that actually fit for the future? So do we, can we actually enable better access to technology? We know that the Precision to Decision report actually estimates that about $25 billion worth of value can be unlocked if we can unlock the benefits of technology. So even though, as Joe said, technology and connectivity is getting much much better in regional Australia. There's still a long way for us to go if we're going to benefit from some of the real-time information that our widgets and digits and, and gadgets and, and, and uh, drones and all those other things can actually deliver, and if we can actually feed that into our supply chain. So we want evidence-based decisions. We want strategic looks at, at, at our regions and how we can grow them. We want agriculture to absolutely underpin that growth, and we want these regional agriculture deals actually to tie the three tiers of government government together, to have everybody moving in the same direction. Uh, a great example is the Western Sydney Airport project. Um, not, not good in some areas, but really good in terms of how it's actually coordinated the three tiers of government. Um, and I think we do need to look strategically at that and use agriculture as underpinning some of this growth that we're going to have in the future. Well, thank you very much. Um, we go perhaps to Liz um, as a first question. What do you propose to make regional areas more livable? <laughs> That's a great question, a great <laughs> one to start with. Look, there are many um, elements that, that frame up, I guess, livability, and that's that's everything from, from sporting amenities, cultural amenities, service amenities such as health, education, um, retail vitality, etc. And And quite honestly, there isn't um, one size that fits all because depending on your age and stage and demographic, what's important to one person will not be important to another. And this herein lies the challenge that we have when we think about 
about regional Australia at, at large because it is so diverse. Um, so, so it's not one simple answer, um, but I guess what, what we try to work with regional communities, yeah, the way we try to work with them is to think about well, what, where are their natural strengths, what are their natural assets, and, and are, are there ways that they can, can seek to improve those strengths and, I guess, mitigate um, some of their perceived um, challenges. I might stop there. Oh, I was just going to add to that um, that it's striking to me, having done a number of inquiries, that Australia only has um, 16 cities above 100,000. That includes Sydney, Melbourne, Perth and Brisbane. And um, Canada, by contrast, has about 75 cities of that size. And I don't think 100,000 is a magic number, but I do think that um, the types of services that one gets in the cities of that type of size, whether it be 80,000 or, or more, including... Um, uh, the, the hospitals and education, health, um, um, child care, the um, transport, uh, arts and so on, uh, and biggest um, airports with re regular public transport are things that are necessary and people want. So I, I don't have any magic solution to getting more of those cities, but I think if you want to have um, a regional centres of that type of size, it makes it a lot more attractive for people to move away from the bigger cities. Yes, mm. and we are seeing, as you said, mm. uh, David, the, the smaller, tiny centres disappearing virtually and mm. the larger centres growing. So people are already doing that without any government policy in place. Mm. Georgie? And I think there's two elements to that. There's one that Paul's just reflected on where you see places like Toowoomba, um, the growth of Toowoomba and, and the area around it and particularly linked to um, having a, an airport that's now connecting it across the eastern seaboard is really significant. And I think the other area in livability is about um, quite small communities. So while we're losing some, we're actually gaining the people who want to, um, as Liz was saying, transition into a regional community. But what I think is really critical in those smaller communities particularly is that we invest in the human capital. So investing in leadership, um, it's one of the things through our community foundation that we've been doing, but I think investing in leadership and investing in people in being able to actually determine their future um, so that they can attract the other the other pieces. So there's there's some policy settings around investing in those larger bits where, where you get an airport and that changes what you can attract. And then I think there's the smaller operations where it's about the human capital and it being able to determine what the future looks like. Mm. And I think like on that, if you put more, and this is where I suppose I'm very biased in this space, but put more money in there and let people spend their own money in the towns. Mm. They, if you're putting extra salaries into town, they support mm. the local tradies, they do the renovation, they, they mm. develop their own, they stimulate their own economic like they do their own economic development in their their things so having access to work that they can do means that they're not the hand is not out they're working and doing it themselves without a mm. sports grant yeah so the i think the interesting thing too is that when we're talking about livability at the moment we're at this really critical juncture where the livability in major cities is actually going down yeah. Yeah. so when people actually think about the things that we australians generally value in terms of of the the the, the social conditions and the level and the community then in actual fact our regional communities are way up here um, mm. with a lot of those things so there's a critical juncture right now where we mm. could make the most of that and actually encourage the move. I, I, I'm a little bit different. I'm not, I, I do understand that we need to have big regional towns and cities and I think that's important. But for me, the hub mentality mm. where, um, such as Toowoomba has done, where mm. it's actually almost hugging the little um, mm. communities around it to make sure that they feel important as well and that there's a place mm. for them in this amazing regional community. I think that's a really important part of growing strong regional communities is not just the town and the city, but seeing the region as part of that and that's where agriculture comes in. Well, you make that point about living in a big city. You are so far away from your amenities, which might be uh, entertainment, school and health. You're sometimes closer to those uh, in a regional mm. area. And, yep. they, I mean, the, the livability is sometimes 15 minutes away from those three important things. Um, and, Fiona, you know, just how important is attracting more people to live in regions to achieving the $100 billion? 
Oh, look, it's, I, I think it's critical. We need strong regions. And it's something that our forefathers did quite well. They sort of had this different notion, which was about build it and they will come. So, you know, when we first saw Australia starting to get settled, we saw lots of uh, railway railway tracks and, and small towns and daily commute services from places like Lake Kajelago to Sydney. Uh, all those sorts of different um, communities started up. And then we've now sort of had these different moves of population to cities and coastal centres etc. And I think it's really interesting now, but we do need, um, so if we're thinking about what the agriculture of the future looks like, what the $100 billion agriculture looks like, or, or even further, um, it, it does, you know, encompass now things like um, can we value add again? Mm -hmm. Can we actually shorten that distance from, from paddock to plate? So it is possible now for me to grow something at Prima, which is in the middle of nowhere, um, and actually have it on somebody's plate in Asia uh, within 24 hours. Now that's phenomenal and that will add phenomenal growth to my and phenomenal value to my business. But it's how can we actually look at and, and support that growth um, and those sorts of things. Even though the jobs are changing, I know that the jobs are going down in some ways on, on farm because of technological improvements, but we can change the way that we look at the jobs in the regions. It sounds and like regional transport is the key there. I think regional connectivity, I would say. So it's physical connectivity with roads and rail, et cetera, et cetera, and for products, but it's also, and digital connectivity too is critical. Are the current policy settings on foreign investment, research and development and water helping or hindering the ag sector in hitting the target? Who would like to take up that one first? Well, I'll start with foreign investment. Um, you know, it's striking that uh, a farmer who wishes to sell his or her property is very much in favour of foreign investment. Uh, but otherwise they tend to be opposed to it. Mm. Although foreign investment has been critical of bringing the um, type of technology and, and, and um, capital that's needed for growing the um, agricultural sector mm. and the resources sector as well, obviously. So um, we did in our agricultural regulation report, I think it was increased the threshold quite a bit was our recommendation there, although the government hasn't obviously adopted that one. We've, um, we've seen, um, you know, investment grow our, our country um, over many generations now. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at some of the aspirations and actions in our report, uh, there's a lot to be done to, to reach this $100 billion uh, industry and to, to grow the regions and make the most of our opportunities that we've got now. Um, the reality of it is in the work that we've done, there's just not enough capital uh, onshore to actually make the most of those opportunities and to realise our potential. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's very much about understanding the conversation, understanding how capital can actually add and be part of our growth, um, how it has in the past and how it can, it is right now and can be again. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have to have that conversation about, it is around contributing to the national interest. It is about building our communities and building our industry and building our country. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's definitely why we think it's a part of our future going forward. Georgie, a lot of foreign investment has gone into the northern sector, so the top end. Really. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting to see the population growth in northwest Australia in that period. And when you look at the last 30 years and the growth of um, the live export market, which has driven population growth in sectors like the Kimberley, but you look at who has invested there over the last you know, 60, 70 years, much of that's been foreign investment. They haven't taken it back anywhere else. They've moved on to other things. They've left that investment there. There's currently significant investment occurring and it's in, it's in water, it's in fences, it's in infrastructure, it's in things that will stay here and will grow that industry, it will make it more um, productive and, and it doesn't go back offshore. So I think we have to be very measured in, in welcoming um, investment in things that will grow agriculture, will grow employment and they'll grow the opportunities for Australians. Does corporate Australia have a role to play in growing regional Australia, Liz? Yes, I'll take that. Um, absolutely. I think um, one of the gaps that I, I saw when I arrived at the Regional Australia Institute, we've had a really strong uh, relationship with, with government, but we hadn't yet established that very important connection with corporate Australia. So um, one of the uh, projects that we're launching this year is actually a new Regional Australia Council, which is essentially industry helping us uh, 
co-create and execute on this new um, population intervention, helping us understand um, where, where are the barriers for, for corporates to not only uh, invest, but to think differently. And uh, Joe and I spend a lot of time talking about this. Uh, what is the future of work? We know what's coming in front of us. Mm -hmm. We know that many jobs that exist today won't exist tomorrow. Um, the notion of flexibility is the norm for most of us. I can see many people here tapping away on, on your laptops. This is life as we know it. Um, our lives and our work are intertwined, so there should be no barrier about where roles are, are undertaken. And so we're looking to work with industry and corporate to understand and unlock the potential of the hundreds of um, and thousands of employees that they have currently residing in our mega cities, and what will it take to unlock that population potential and talent to bring them out to regional Australia to realise the opportunities that exist for them to not only have a better lifestyle, but to be homeowners, to be part of a community, to be more connected because we've got major issues around mental health and isolation. And we know that regional Australia outperforms uh, cities on the wellness um, index and happiness index. So there's an enormous enormous role for, for corporates to play here. Um, governments, uh, you know, absolutely have a critical role in this as well. So it's crucial that the mix of government, corporate and community sector come together um, to collectively achieve the best outcome here for our nation. Could you name a policy lever that would work? I mean, from Paul, we've heard that tax incentives are badly targeted. Perhaps you can kick it off. If, if they're badly targeted, what would work better? Well, in our um, trend, in other reports, we've said basically that, and also in, in the uh, RATCAP report, that it should be locally led with state and um, governments taking the principal line to it, supported by the federal government, not by the federal government um, taking the leadership role. Uh, we think that um, the problem with, uh, with ma many of the policies in the past have been that the state and the federal governments for various reasons have gone in different directions. Mm -hmm. uh, they've put um, money which is often, or programs which are often contradictory to each other mm -hmm. rather than having a consistent view. Now you can use a scattergun approach or you can use a, um, a picking winners approach uh, but the way I'd um, articulate it would be that we should be um, looking at the strengths of the particular region and in the TRE report we would show the types of strengths in certain regions based upon what we call a functional economic region and allocating resources sensibly based upon what the local community thinks they want. I'll give you a good example of where this doesn't happen. Uh, I mean, in the La Trobe Valley, Eddie Maguire and the Premier of Victoria decided to go out and um, spend a fortune, about $150 million, on a new stadium, and they gave the mayor and the council half an hour's notice of that. And um, that wasn't local consultation to me. And now, did the council or did the community want that stadium or would they want something else? And they were never asked. So that's the type of thing I think would lead better value, yes. yes. Anybody else want to comment on that? I don't know, a nice little tax break uh, maybe for companies that have got a certain percentage of employees with a rural postcode? Uh, I'll answer that one because I, I should go to that. I mean, the, the ZTO, the Zone Tax Offset, is based um, comes back to 1945. It's um, currently allocated 45% of it goes to people living in um, Mackay, Townsville, Chickens and Darwin. Uh, it ranges from $57 a year up to about $1,100 a year. There are um, uh, people, uh, we, we recommended that it, well, it had to be abolished because of a number of reasons. A, that it wasn't achieving what its objective was, which was to um, stimulate um, and uh, offset cost benefit, um, pressures and uh, hardship in remote areas. Uh, secondly, that if you wanted to make it meaningful, you'd have to increase the rate substantially. I mean, people in Townsville were saying that it should be $10,000, not $57. Now, if Townsville's $10,000, how much would um, somewhere in the middle of Australia have to be? And thirdly, it's um, actually constitutionally unsound. It, um, if it was challenged in court, in the High Court, it would lose. So 
how can you propose an increase in the scheme which, um, if it was increased substantially, would likely lead to a High Court challenge? Mm. I, I'm going to have to bow to the professional mm -hmm. expertise up in my panel members there, but I, I have to say that that's... Um, I mean, I think it's the mix of incentives and... Mm -hmm. um, it, it, so it's chicken and egg, isn't it? Yes. And so, you know, recently I was asked to provide a, a light bulb idea about um, what was going to transform Australia in the next decade. And I suggested that we double the population of regional Australia. And it was a great conversation. I've never had such fascinating ideas come through. And all sorts of different things came through about... Uh, nobody actually said abolish the states, which I thought might have happened. But um, it was actually about, you know, it was things about should we be actually looking... Um, should we be moving the state, the, the seat of government in some of our states away from the mega and into the regional areas. Um, what should we be doing around incentivisation? If we actually want business to go into these areas, um, can we incentivise them through some tax? But I take your point about the federal government leading this. And I'm absolutely frustrated every minute of the day nearly about the lack of proper consultation mm -hmm. with some of our rural and regional people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, rural and regional people um, in communities have amazing expertise and skills and um, vision and they have um, thoughts. They know their communities and they know where they want to take them. Yet our three tiers of government overwhelmingly just ignore them. And so it's... it's and don't effectively consult. Whatever we're dealing with, we're dealing with Murray-Darling Basin at the moment, all those different things. It's very, very frustrating. Frustrating. So, mm. I think can we use a mix of incentives? Maybe throw in a tax one somewhere in there, um, and um, and other sorts of levers to try and have this chicken and egg um, incentives and and pull and push and government and industry and everybody working together. Mm. But part of the pull is what makes a regional area livable. So, does anybody want to address that, Liz? Perhaps. A I mean, we touched on, you know, there's a range of things that, that make a community livable, but I might just come back to that, yeah. that last point um, briefly. I mean, we're, we're always looking for different policy levers and, and that's very important, but I think what, what we'd like to see out of the new national campaign is actually putting the, the power of choice in, in Australians changing hearts and minds so that they feel that they've got the same opportunities if they mm. choose to move either themselves or their family to a regional area. One of the greatest barriers for people uh, choosing to move to regional Australia is what will their uh, partner slash spouse do when they get there? And so this speaks to the notion of where I started a moment ago around that workplace um, flexibility and um, employing, you know, the very people that, that Jo has on her database who mm. are ready and available to work but don't need to be in place in the in the office we need to get away from this uh, mentality mm. i had uh, three years with westpac enormous organization um, more than forty thousand employees at the time and i can't tell you the majority of roles that did not need to be done in the office so if people are assured that they're going to maintain uh, the same professional opportunities assured to have, uh, you know, that it, that it won't set their career back, that their mm. salary will be maintained, mm. give them the choice. And so this doesn't need to be government-led. This is why yeah. we speak about this as a societal shift. And, and I think that once we start to provide the information, people will. We know people are leaving the cities. Um, we've got a report coming out, so I'm not going to, to bust the, the breaking news um, in this report, but people are moving and uh, we're going to see that the more that we can... Um, educate them about the opportunities that do exist around uh, not only uh, employment, but the opportunities to have a better lifestyle. We're going to end up with ghettos in our four major mm -hmm. capitals and anybody who's um, thinking that that's a good future for our country uh, has rocks in their head. Mm. But it is well, definitely all we need to know is whether oh, the supermarkets in the country have got toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, there is a mega trend happening as we speak. The coronavirus mm -hmm. is forcing people to consider how they would do their job from home for one, two weeks. Uh, the Chinese have adapted beautifully. They've done, you know, singing and dancing from home and shared videos of it and, uh, and it's been quite a shift. They've ordered in food and we've heard about that yesterday. Um, you know, do you see perhaps a mega trend happening as we speak, working so, from home so, possible? Serena, I think that's right. I think, I mean, I remember um, 
some of us are a bit older and might remember the uh, pilot strike and yeah. that actually introduced some people to teleconferencing. So I started teleconferencing in about 1988. Um, and started working remotely in 89. We did some of our first teleworking trials with the state government in Queensland in 96. Um, so that was west of Longreach, so a policy, there was a policy officer. I actually think we're more risk averse to teleworking currently uh, with state and federal government than we have been. I, during the 90s, we had quite a few policy officers working remotely into Canberra. Um, I actually see that this may well be an opportunity for us to realise that there are great efficiencies for someone who lives an hour from a town and three and a half hours from Brisbane. I've actually had 30 years of a pretty rewarding career mm. um, and hopefully a few more years to go yet, initially just with a fax and a landline, um, to now be able to sit in video conference and hold that connection from 8am to 5.30pm the other day um, when the Canberra connection dropped out a few times, um, you know, my, my satellite held. And so I think this is an opportunity for us to see that working remotely is extremely efficient, is possible from many locations and provides, and there can be extremely rewarding careers that can be done remotely. Mm -hmm. So I, I do see this as an opportunity for regions to, and for businesses to do exactly what Joe's trying to support them to do. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, the work Joe's doing is in incredibly critical because it's about enabling businesses to understand that someone does not need to be physically present to be productive um, and that, and also instilling the confidence in people working remotely that you don't need to be physically present to be respected. So I think that that duality of how we actually get that working in the regions, but also we need to increase the visibility of people like myself who work remotely um, and, and can have a rewarding life. Mm. Can I say, Serena, I know there's some great examples out there at the moment of companies that are trialling it, mm. um, not just through uh, an organisation like Joe's, but uh, companies like Telstra at the moment uh, are really actively looking at how, uh, you know, flexible workplaces, and we talk about this a lot in terms of diversity as well, because mm. agriculture is one of those few industries that has about 50% of women and 50% of men, it's just that most of them are, are remote, and we want to see more women coming through into the into the decision making and the advocacy and the executive ranks. But, uh, you know, the, one of the learning Learnings, I think, from some of the companies that are trying it is that the productivity actually goes up. Yeah. So that, you know, it doesn't mean you that in the old days we all had to be in the office and we all had to clock on. Goodness, we used to have the time clocks, didn't they, where people stuck it in the, the thing in the... Got to bring them back again. Brought the week. thing back and stuck yeah. the thing in and did it. But now, depending on your role, a lot of the new jobs can be done remotely and in actual fact people are more productive because they don't have to spend the time travelling, uh, you know, they're in their own environment and they can, you know, whether it's being at home flexible, whether it's working four days a four-day week instead of a five, it's all sorts of different things now. Now that are really adding to our environment and our working life and our regional communities, mm. which I think is so important. But even environmentally as well, I don't know yeah. if you've seen any mm. of the, the images of the air quality over China at the moment, yes. how it's improved out of sight in the last two weeks with um, less cars on the road. So just even that that whole people, are, the, the organisations, corporates in particular, are really trying to hit these targets of your diversity of all sorts, um, but really pushing for that geographic diversity as being another sort of, of target for businesses as well. So much of our work is service work, isn't it? So it is the now. service industry can yeah. operate remotely to a degree yeah. and even Coles and Woolworths will have um, checkout free if, uh, checkouts free of people. There's a great question here on Mentimeter if I can go to it and it's um, perhaps, Joe, given that you're in the education space as well as corporate work from home, so what can be done to improve the education and TAFE issues for agriculture in regional areas? So, I mean, it crosses over a few things, but certainly there's that education issue and then perhaps education in the agricultural area for a, a question for Fiona. And Dear. Um, I think I can... How political can I get? Um, I'm a, an ex Hurlston girl. I went to Hurlston Agricultural High School. And so it's been quite interesting being in the alumni Facebook groups and watching um, what has happened sort of at a state government level there with, I suppose, just not putting a value on, like, um, educating at that age group, um, I think. Like, I even just look at my finished school in 2001 
and a huge percentage of my year leavers. So we're just reflecting I'm a baby. on what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, went into careers in agriculture, and a lot of them were the day students who, in the first week of year seven, was quite often they lived. They grew up in southwest Sydney. They saw a sheep for the first time. They saw cows. They saw the pigs, and all of these things. And it, like I can remember, one of the day girls in my year was literally her year twelve leaving thing was that she wanted to be the chick on landline like that was her thing and she'd grown up in Campbelltown so I, I don't know how you solve that but I think that a societal value on on agriculture in primary schools through to high schools I think you see like um George the farmer is my I don't know if you haven't come across um children's books that are literally that food and fibre and where it comes from and really getting that into not just country kids but into to metro families of actually that disconnect is just what's such a huge thing there with, with education. So mm. I don't know, that's probably not a fabulous answer yeah, to it. but I mean, it's one of the things AgForce has focused on is the Schools to Industry Partnership Program and we've worked with all the ag industries, not just Broadacre and... Um, we've run three Ag Educators conferences, which have been around helping teachers to actually contextualise agriculture into a classroom, not just Ag Science, but mm. English and Maths and Geography and all these other subjects. Um, geography is probably not called that anymore. It's World Studies or something. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important. The research I did with Condinen in the 90s was that children have made up their minds about whether a tr a, an occupation is ethical or not by the time they're 10. And it may be younger now that maturity is is very fast so it's critically important that we not only have agriculture in the curriculum but that we be investing in our educators to help them contextualize so the examples mm. they're using are Australian agricultural examples because we have a growing migrant population as Paul said these are people who um, English may not be their first language and they may have no connection to Australian agriculture so actually helping them to understand that Interestingly, I've had some great conversations with migrants who come from agricultural regions overseas and are really interested in our practices and follow it in the media. Um, so I think it's really important that we be investing. So we've, we're seeing some investment from the federal government, certainly in Queensland. Um, we were defunded last year for our Schools to Industry Partnership Program. We have a very small program we do with a, a group of um, schools called the Gateway Schools to Agriculture. Um, but there is not a prioritisation of agriculture as being... Um, a career pathway and yet that's what when we run our Ag Educators Conference they're desperate for materials because they have the demand from mm. particularly urban based students to have a career in agriculture so AgForce will continue to try and drive that investment and we're working with some tertiary partners as well who want to who recognize that to bring them through to tertiary you need to start in primary school mm. so we've got Ag in the curriculum but we need to help our educators and invest in that New South mm. Wales, or is it a national program, has had the Archie Bull, where you yeah. um, paint the de the Jersey dairy yeah. cow uh, life size model, <laughs> yeah. and you know, it's a national program national. and it brings young people into that whole realm of talking about agriculture. Young farmers mm. actually go into those schools, um, and I think you know I totally agree. Uh, and we we also work with with Prime Minister's Education Foundation and others to make sure that there are resources that teachers who don't know much about agriculture can bring into the curriculum. But I think, it, going back to the original question about TAFE, to me it is about valuing um, education mm -hmm. in whatever form it comes. And I think, you know, if we look overseas, a lot of people say that, you know, to be a successful and a, a good regional hub or a good community hub, you need education. But it's not necessarily a university. It can be recognising the variety of careers. And in, in New South Wales, they do have a program where... Um, it, it goes around the state every second year, but it started in this in Junee with a, with a teacher who was passionate about it and wanted to showcase the careers that were available to her students from years nine to twelve, and so sixty odd careers um, actually were showcased at that at that on that day um, for kids who were perhaps thinking about it. But a lot mm. of those careers actually don't need university degrees. Yeah. Um, some do. I mean, and you think about finance, you think about agronomy, you think about science, you think about all those. There's some, some amazing careers um, that, are, that certainly do need edu um, tertiary education, university degrees and on. But there's a whole lot of other degrees too um, that maybe don't. 
but we need to actually, when we're thinking about building the regions and, and strategically thinking about placing resources and education, what it is that's needed, and we reflect back on consultation and all those things, mm -hmm. um, I think then we start focusing again on, you know, what sort of educational resources do we need in the regions and um, what outside of TAFE, because it's learning. People want to now learn lifelong. It's not just something that you want to do when you're young. How significant still is, though, the digital divide in regional Australia with the cities? Uh, is it still, a, uh, you know, is it improving enough to facilitate learning, working, um, yeah, commuting? Uh, well, oh. we, we make a bit of a joke that we can pretty much map natural disasters and NBN rollout with where <laughs> people are signing up with us. So. There's a flood, we have a spike, there's fires, we have a spike, and then the NBN hits a town and we also have a spike. So I, um, as far as people looking to engage on the employee side for us, um, I see it in a very clear, um, a clear way that that is still a challenge for a lot of people, and especially when I go more remotely to speak and do capacity building workshops and things like that, there is always a percentage of the room that is like, I can't even like make a phone call half the time or when we were doing onboarding calls with candidates, I would get the odd, like, just wait a sec, wait a second. You'd hear them shuffling to wherever they know the phone service is and had one girl sort of hanging off the, the veranda. I was like, are you planning on having your desk out there? But that it's still a massive challenge for, for a lot of people that we're dealing with to, to access the workforce there. Yeah. I'm surprised Paul didn't mention his report on regional telecommunications. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's, it's been something so many, I was so um, <laughs> part of a, the regional telecommunications review uh, prior mm. to the, the more, most recent one. Uh, we just made huge strides mm. from going from a landline of fax and a dial-up um, to be able to hold a video conference for, you know, eight, nine hours a day. And I do quite a bit of video, video conferencing of... Um, Skymaster. I actually think Skymaster Plus is probably more stable than some of the mm. other NBN connections. Um, look, our, our mobile, we have a couple of towers near us now. We, we were a black spot for a long time. Um, might have done a bit of campaigning around that. It, it, it does make a difference because it's meant that we've got productivity out in the paddock, so things, aren't, things are being done on the go and, and so forth. I actually think the biggest barrier, and this was identified by Dave Lamb in the precision to decision is people's ability to use the connection yeah. that's available to them. So the current consultation that's just closed was around the digital hub, which again, another passion project of <laughs> ours. Um, but it is about how do you get productivity from the existing connections that you can get and how do you drive that productivity into your business? How do you adopt things like Office 365 that means that you can deal with it in the tractor and you don't have to go back to the computer to deal with it? Mm. How do you use this cloud computing efficiently and effectively in your business? How do you have someone on the end of the line who's going to help you bring about that productivity gain to, to ensure that you're actually getting the deal and you're cutting the deal while you're out there doing it? So... You know, to me, it's about the individual's ability to use the connections that are available, and I think we've made huge strides in the last three years around the reliability of our connection. Where we're lacking is the people's ability to use Skills. that effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd just say on that, um, yes, the, that, that report did show quite a few things in the right direction. There's still a way to go, but it is quite... Um, I mean, to give you an example, on the Royal Flying Doctor Service, they give out ECG devices and they can now tell straight away whether a doctor needs to go to a person because he's got a cardiac arrest mm. or whether they can just talk them through and take some tablet or something. Mm. Yeah, phenomenal. Mm. David, maybe if I draw you in, just to cover off on, you know, we've seen the decline in farmer numbers. It, does it suggest that something's fundamentally wrong with agriculture? So first to you and then I think Fiona maybe. So. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, I think maybe I covered that uh, with some of my comments in, in my talk, but I don't think there is necessarily anything wrong with that. You don't. Uh, in that uh, farmers are doing things in their own interests. Uh, you know, consolidation is happening for a reason. There's productivity gains from that and profitability gains, but it does lead to these tensions that we've been, we've been talking about. And I, I think the risk is that if we, if we decide we want to have uh, more people living in regional economies... Uh, the way not to do that is stopping farm consolidation because uh, if you think that having people living in regional towns is a good idea, you should do that a different way rather than stopping consolidation because that's what's going to get us to the 100 billion. That's what we need to be uh, competitive on world markets 
because if we stand still, um, we're, we'll go backwards in terms of that competitiveness. So. so with almonds growing where dairy once was, you've got the hulling, perhaps renewable energy from biomass, you've got employment seasonal and water and pollination. So you've got other jobs. Well, I think, but I think one of the tensions there is that the jobs won't necessarily be in the same place. Because we now have a water market, mm -hmm. the place where dairy is at the moment is not really where the almond trees are being planted. Mm -hmm. So there is a structural adjustment tension um, thing there to be managed. Uh, but again, I, I'm, I'm not convinced the way to fix that is by stopping water trade. Uh, the, way, the way to solve that problem is think about how, how to help those people adjust. Uh, you know, what, what's the role of government there? Is there anything the government do that can help people adjust rather than stopping the very thing we need to improve productivity? That's a tension you deal with all the time at the yeah. NFF, isn't it, Fiona? Certainly is, particularly <laughs> at the moment. Um, but the, I, mean, I think the first point, and I, um, it struck me at the beginning, I think that bigger is not always necessarily better or more productive. Um, certainly in some sorts of farms, like broadacre farms, yes, where it engages now, you're using very you know, valuable equipment in terms of no-till technology, uh, any of the GPS-driven stuff, weeds, eggs, all those different things. They're, they're incredibly expensive and scale helps when you're doing that sort of thing. So yes, I think we are seeing some consolidation there. But on the other side of it, and you might remember back to one of the graphs David, that I think you had up there around the growth in the different products. So horticulture is one of the industries that's actually shown double digit growth. And it's actually, those almond trees are actually not producing yet much at all, if any, you know, they're actually very small. So we're not looking at that as driving the production. What we are seeing is that horticulture now is able to, you know, we've talked a bit about trade over the last yeah. couple of days. Mm -hmm. So horticulture is now because of a number of our new agreements, because of some of the protocols that we're getting around, it's actually able to deliver. If I look at Indonesia, the new agreement that we have with Indonesia, for example, which we haven't even seen the benefits of yet, um, it's looking at opening up things like carrots um, and opportunities for carrots um, into that market. So in, if we're looking at a horticultural business, and I know Emma Germano has been here too, then it doesn't necessarily involve massive amounts of land or scale. It can be quite um, actually specialised. So I'd say that either you're getting bigger, perhaps, depending on your farm, or you're getting more specialised. Mm. And either of those things can actually deliver more value. Um, and so they are the two tools, I think, that, that people are actually using. And certainly, you know, change is always um, difficult and change is confronting, but people do need to have options and hope. They need to be consulted. They need to feel that they've, they've got plans and that they can still, you know, have some, some, some pathways as to what's going to happen and some opportunities in front of them. And I think there is plenty of that at the moment, even though there's some tensions out there as well. Paul, something for well, you to pick up on. And I was just going to agree with David. I mean, you can't put barriers into productivity growth because that would be self-defeating. And scale will vary. I mean, in every industry, sometimes larger scale gives benefits and sometimes it doesn't. That's up to the industry to determine. But um, uh, government's role is to uh, have the regulation as um, efficient as possible, to invest in infrastructure in the right areas uh, sensibly, and, and really um, let the farmers getting through their business and local communities grow their communities. There's a question from Mentimeter, and thanks very much for using this system. I think it's worked reasonably well, and um, if, if any of you want to ask questions at the floor, then um, please do so and wave at me, because it's kind of tricky to see. But one of the questions, and Paul, you can answer it, is um, there's been some amazingly successful refugee and immigrant resettlement mm. schemes. I mean, if you think of the lover duck yes, yes, um, processing, uh, Korean refugees, those sorts of things. How, did you investigate why they were successful compared to some of the other programs, the immigrants, where they've left after three years? Oh, particularly, uh, I think the local community was actively supporting the the immigrants, and there was a uh, uh, um, and they were actively welcoming them. That, that's that's the important thing. Otherwise, they become a settlement that's separate from the com indig um, the local community that was there before. Uh, if that happens, then it can be successful. Obviously. Uh, there has to be a critical mass of the immigrants. I mean, the first uh, Greek person to arrive in Australia found it very difficult, but um, once there is a, a critical mass of people who have that culture and that language, it helps um, the integration process very much. So uh, a sensible government policy along with a very welcoming community is, is critical, I would have thought. Liz Ritchie at uh, Regional Australia Institute, you've done a lot of work 
on why immigrants choose to settle. You'd agree with them that it's, it's the, how the community responds to them. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Um, we have been uh, working in the regional migra migration space for a number of years and actually uh, last year we were able to launch the Steps to Settlement Success and now we've been um, fortunate to employ a migration director who's actually travelling around the country working with uh, regional communities to help them develop their own what we call locally led migration strategies and it all starts from the, the community and their intent to, to be welcoming and to ensure that uh, cultural um, integration is front and centre uh, for, for the migration program to work. There are, there are a number of other really important components. Obviously, employment is critical. That will be the piece that gets them there. But some of the challenges are around um, infrastructure such as housing. Uh, this has been a big challenge for many communities, uh, transport, and then other essential services such as um, English language classes and, and having access to interpreters. So, look, the, the communities that have done it well have done it through enormous volunteer effort and the Neil example uh, is a great example of that. But, you know, where we see regional communities' um, populations declining but also having low unemployment, it's a, it's a real challenge because businesses cannot um, scale up, they cannot grow, and, and therefore um, they find themselves in a, in a really tricky position. So, so accessing regional migration is, is a fantastic solution and it's a, it's a large part of our um, population plan for regional Australia at large. And I think, Serena, the other part to that is that um, when I look at a couple of towns near me, so I look at Kilcoy, they've done... Um, significant transition of migrants to be full-time residents to support the meatworks um, and, and really successfully where there's now multi-generational um, sort of employment there. Um, but then I look at um, the Swickers Meatworks who are now still about 40% reliant on backpacker because um, we, we've got that labour shortage, although we've also got high unemployment. So the challenge is about the work that Australians um, want and choose to do and the work that migrants um, are willing to do as well. So there's two levels. There's the professional work, but there's also the, the physical work and the need for that secure labour force to grow businesses that are processing agriculture. Again, agriculture is driving these economies. It, it's a core employer in these towns and it's critical <coughs> that it, it be supported. So you and, and Georgie, you are a very strong advocate for the growth of agriculture in regional areas. Um, but there is renewable energy, there is mining, there are other opportunities that could actually outstrip um, agriculture. I think they'll be alongside. I've always been a coexistence fan and I've taught coexistence for years and I think that when we look at communities like uh, Southern Inland Queensland, we've had coexistence for 30, 40 years with resources sector and the same with Central Queensland. Um, in my own region, we have... Um, they, they fit neatly into Liz's piece. They've come back in their sort of probably 20 to 25 to 35 bracket to raise their families in our community, but one or the other is commuting back to work in the resources sector, either in, in gas or um, coal. And yes, we've got renewables as well. Um, I, I think that's another whole conversation around policy settings because we have some policy setting challenges about renewable... There is a renewable powerhouse in regional Australia that can't actually get to the grid. Um, so while a, a resources project might be a seven-year time frame and you can get the grid upskilled, we've now got some, some very strong media today around, you know, northwest Queensland and the inability of... And, and now market, you know, have had to put warnings to the market that um, they can't get that power onto the grid. And the OEMO... Um, development of, of that. So we're, we're missing an opportunity with those things. And I know, Victoria, there's some real constriction there as well. So um, in the short term, agriculture is still going to drive our economies. I believe that we will continue to coexist with, particularly with the resources and the renewables sector. Um, that's very live in my own region where we have both a you know, coal and a power station and gas and now wind turbines. So it's very real where we live. Um, but I think we can coexist. And it is about... What I come back to is what Paul was saying. 
We need to be part of the conversation. So none of this can happen in isolation and the community needs to be co-designing and that's the agricultural community as well. We need to actually be involved and engaged in the policy development and the legislative frameworks so that it's not a surprise and it's actually the future that we are co-designing. And, and I think that's the critical piece in whatever the policy setting is, that it's not a surprise for the community to which it's going to come. So whether that's the broad agricultural community or whether it's that small community that's getting funding for something, co-design is absolutely critical in whatever setting we're, we're um, framing up. Well, we've seen the Energy Minister announce that there is going to be investment away from solar and wind and into more kind of novel ideas of hydrogen, uh, lithium, uh, name the others, but, um, you know, biofuels. So, I mean, you know, should there be perhaps policy incentives that says where that should happen? Well, I mean, regional, so we have, I was just, just actually finding where it said it in our report because I was sure that we did actually touch on it. And so we actually have a metric around renewable energy and saying that um, Australian farm energy sources are 50% renewable by 2030. I think it's recognising that regional Australia is a great place to have renewable energy. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, we need to make sure, and I think that's going hand in hand too with some of the conversations that we've had over the last couple of days again around emissions and, and transitioning to a lower carbon economy, all of those things. Things. And I think it recognises that we can actually, um, we can do better than we're doing now by relying on the grid, even though Australia is this amazing, when we just talk about the grid in Australia, mm. of course, we're actually talking about like 400 grids or mm. something that we have in Australia. We're actually a, a country with some of the most grids um, of all. But we do need to be open to new energy sources. We do need to be open to, to doing it better. Um, we need to be open in, on farm. There's a great opportunity, and they do it much better in Europe than we do um, around waste to energy. So on a farm, there's quite a lot of waste um, that we generate. And, and I say waste conservatively because it's what we regard as waste is not always, you know, like plastic containers and things. Um, but it is, it can generate energy. And at the moment, um, you know, in some ways, we're sort of wasting that capacity mm -hmm. and it can provide income it can provide mm -hmm. um, you know if we're thinking about diversified income streams if we're thinking about strong and viable and diverse economies in, in regional areas um, if we're thinking about growing populations some of these uh, things really can grow our regions rather than f detract from them and sit alongside some of the traditional industries um, as long as we strategically plan for them and I think we're seeing that certainly I know um, both Wagga and Gladstone have got a lot of work happening around that renewables um, space using really alternate um, fuel sources. And I think if you look at in Western Queensland, certainly there's been a lot of work done around having small grids that service that, that region uh, so that they are, um, you know, that, that's a sort of a regional approach. And then I know in some of the intensive industries, they're already doing that on farm. We're there mm -hmm. and, and we've got that happening in the processing sector as well, the meat processing sector. So we're capturing that and actually using it back in the plant or back on the farm. So there's sort of, I think there's a layering of how this applies and it's how we um, encourage that investment and that extrapolation to a broader sense. We could be going on for a long time talking about uh, poor policy decisions in the energy markets in Australia, so I won't go there today. <laughs> That's another whole panel, Paul. <laughs> and we could have gone down the track of uh, decentralisation and whether it's been successful. There is a question here, maybe a couple of lines from each of you before we wrap. Decentralisation as a, as a government policy push, could it work better? David? Yeah, right, that's a tricky thing for me to say anything about. Uh, <laughs> oh, look, it could, I suppose. Uh, I'll, go, I'll go sort of back to some of my earlier comments about, or, or my earlier thoughts about, well, we've kind of got to let the market rule here. So, uh, you know, if people want to go and live in, in regional communities, well, that, that's fine, but I'm, I'm just a bit worried about forcing things that people don't want to do because ultimately you'll, you'll probably lose. They'll move back. Canberra was an, a good example of decentralisation, of course, in 1927. So has it been successful? Perhaps, I don't know. But um, I'm with David, it shouldn't, uh, you can't force it. People, um, it has to be where people decide to live uh, based upon their own interests. Liz, where you've seen it work really successfully? Ballarat, potentially, or Geelong, Well, or? I was just gonna say, I couldn't agree more with, with uh, David and Paul on the point that it has to be about choice. So. But look, I mean, it, it comes and goes. It's fashionable, then it's unfashionable. And ultimately, it's an option, it's one lever, but it's not everything. And this is why we're really uh, focusing on working with Corporate Australia. So if we can work hand in hand to think about ways that uh, corporates can 
think about decentralisation, not just uh, hard infrastructure, but as we've discussed, decentralising their workforce. And Joe, you are decentralised. <laughs> oh, I'm, yeah, but I'm the, the queen advocate for it. Like I, I think that, yeah, that physical decentralised of an office and physically moving people is just doesn't work. Like AgriFutures to Wagga, I think three or four of the staff went and they rehired locally, which was fabulous for the town. Um, but yeah, why why make it be a spot decentralised? nationally and I think that that diversity of thought that comes with that and um, and especially for corporates as well is that especially for um, a lot of organisations that are national companies they service 100% of the, the, the country but they've got no concept of how a third of Australians think, buy, live and so <coughs> if you employ them you get this crazy market insight into your half your customers so... I think it's really, it, it's very true that we need, it, it's got to be a choice, but we actually have to create the choice. So we have to create the opportunities. So there needs to be a focus on providing opportunities where people can make a choice and there are career options. So I think that um, while it, I think it's easy to say people can choose, but you need to create those opportunities for them to have that choice. And I think there needs to be a focus on that. Mm, I totally agree. So I hate the word decentralisation, actually, because I think it sounds negative already. Mm. Um, I like the word regionalisation yep. because I'm a strong believer in strong and vibrant rural, um, rural and regional communities. And I agree with Georgie. We have to create those choices. And I think whilst everything has to be through choice and I think everything also obviously has to be to business cases, there's some outstanding examples. If we think about RMS in Parks, if we think about the tax office in Albury, if we think about New South Wales DPI in Orange, there's a lot of, you know, actual decisions that have been made to move parts of government departments that were similar to, to the perhaps locating Canberra initially, where decisions were made, people were employed, some people moved, some people didn't, local people were employed. And I think, you know, sometimes those sorts of decisions can underpin um, regional development. So I don't think we should dismiss those things, but it has to be about... Uh, and I think the time is right. That's the other thing. I think at the moment our, our city, our, our mega cities are, are getting bigger by the minute and some of the livability issues in there are causing people to think anyway, very um, laterally about what their future might look like. Some of the millennials who are really interested in sustainability mm. and quality of life are looking now at regional and rural Australia and, and looking at it as an opportunity. And I think we have to absolutely grasp that opportunity with both hands. And we are going to have to see a lot of work done on climate change, how that is adapted to in regional areas. They will do the heavy lifting on caring for the environment. So there are going to be a lot more opportunities as long as they are funded. So um, a fascinating discussion. It has ranged quite widely. I haven't really gone through half of the questions here. I've gone through most of the questions on Mentimeter and thank you very much for participating in that. So I'd like you all to thank the panel.